So today I want to talk about the idea of reboot. Reboot. And a couple of things come to my mind when I think, when I thought about this word, I was preparing this message. A couple of kind of streams of thought came to my mind. And so I'm going to kind of go over those. The first one being that kind of, uh, it's, it's kind of a phrase that was made famous by a British sitcom called The IT Crowd. And there are these two guys named Moss and Roy, and they work in basically the basement, like the dungeon of this huge corporate building in the IT department. And they get so sick of getting the same calls all the time that, that are things that are so easy for people to solve themselves that they make this reel-to-reel -reel answering machine. Yeah, it's a little bit of an older show. Uh, that picks up the phone for them and says, have you tried turning it off and on again? And of course, an awesome British accent, to which the, the caller will, will usually say, oh, hadn't thought of that. Yeah, that worked. And then they hang up. So they're able to screen so many of their calls that way, and it gives them a lot more time to get into all sorts of antics. But it reminds me, too, of when I, uh, when I worked in cell phone sales, and so often people would come in, I can't tell you how many times, and they would say, oh, there's, my phone's broken, I need a new phone, I need a new tablet, I need a new computer, whatever it is, what's wrong with it, it's glitchy, something's going on, it's just not right. And uh, just kind of like at the end, of the, oh, I need a new phone, and I'd say, okay, well, hold the phone, pun intended, <laughs> and we're going to try one thing first. Let's try rebooting your, your phone, your device, your computer and see what happens. And so we would, and 99% of the time, that would solve the problem, and then the machine would be running smoothly again. So that's kind of the first idea of reboot, and one of the definitions from the Webster's Dictionary on reboot <coughs> is this. The act or an instance of starting something anew or making a fresh start. making a fresh start. There's this really cool quote by C.S. Lewis from his book, Mere Christianity. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. But he said this, and I'm just going to put it up on the screen for you here. And I just think it's so profound. We all want progress, but progress means getting nearer to the place you want to be. And if you have taken a wrong turning, then to go forward does not get you any nearer to keep on going. If you are on the wrong road, progress means doing an about turn and walking back to the right road. And in that case, the man or the person who turns back soonest is the most progressive person. We have all seen this when we do arithmetic. When I have started a sum the wrong way, the sooner I admit this and go back and start over again, the faster I shall get on. There is nothing progressive about being pig-headed and refusing to admit a mistake. And I think if you look at the present state of the world, it's pretty plain that humanity has been making some big mistakes. We are on the wrong road. And if that is so, we must go back. Going back is the quickest way on. And I just think that ties so well with this idea of, of reboot of turning it off and on again. The second kind of stream of thought, which I'm going to spend the meat of this message on, the most of this message on, is as I was thinking about what reboot looks like in the life of a believer, in the life of a Christian. Um, and I think about that, and I think about, I think about the Sabbath. It kind of led me to think about the Sabbath. And, and you know, we all know about... The Sabbath is the day of the week that we rest from doing work. And we know, too, that Jesus said that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath uh, was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So keep that in mind as an encouragement as we go through this message. But so I, so I was drawn to think, okay, what does reboot look like? And well, okay, well, that looks like rest. It looks like the Sabbath rest. And then, and then I remembered something really interesting from the Old Testament. Something called the Sabbath year. We read about it in, in the book of Exodus, Deuteronomy, and Leviticus. And there was something that really stood out to me about this. And so I wanted to kind of unpackage that today and look at that and how that applies 
to our current situation, the eternal principle that we find in the Sabbath year. And it's, it's kind of neat in a nerdy way for me because the Sabbath year is actually supposed to be every seven years. It's the seventh year. And uh, mine and Megan's seven year anniversary, wedding anniversary, is actually this weekend. So I thought that was kind of cool. Not reading too much into it, but I thought it was fun. Okay, so let's um, start off by reading some of these scriptures. And, and before I do that, I just kind of want to share the, the main idea. If you could sum up the Sabbath year in a sentence, it would be this. Stop the machine. And that ties really well in what we were talking about, about have you tried turning it off and on again? And I know a lot of us are thinking, man, and I've seen it on social media, <clears throat> Can, can we just reboot 2020? Like, is there, can somebody turn this off and on again? I think that's what we need. But in, in that, I think what a lot of people are thinking is, is, oh, let's go back to the way that things were, is that we want life as we know it. We want things to go back to, quote, unquote, normal. And I don't think that we actually need that kind of a reboot. I think that what God is speaking in this time is that we do need a reboot, but a different kind, something that maybe we hadn't noticed. So let's get into this. So the first, the scriptures are, are listed, the scripture references on the screen. Let's look at that. Starting at Exodus uh, chapter 23 and verse 11. I'm actually going to start in verse 10. For six years you shall sow your land and gather in its yield. But the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow that the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave the beasts of the field may eat. You shall do likewise with your vineyard and with your olive orchard. So it's the idea of releasing our hand from the land, giving, giving the land a Sabbath rest. Let's continue. So the next one I want to look at is Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 1 through 2. And it says, at the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release. And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor shall release what he has lent to his neighbor. He shall not exact it of his neighbor, his brother, because the Lord's release has been proclaimed. So this is another facet, very interesting facet of this Sabbath year. And the last one I want to look at is Leviticus chapter 25 verses 1 through 7. It says, The Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you, the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years you shall sow your field, and for six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in its fruits. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. You shall not reap what grows of itself in your harvest or gather the grapes of your undressed vine. It shall be a year of solemn rest for the land. The Sabbath of the land shall provide food for you, for yourself, and for your male and female slaves. Now hold the phone there for a second. It's not saying that God endorses slavery. The terminology here is actually for hired hands or hired workers. And for your hired worker and the sojourner, the journeyer, the wanderer, traveler who, who lives with you. And for your cattle and for all the animals that are in your land, all its yield shall be for food. So this, there's this idea of, of commonality, of community. The Hebrew word for the Sabbath year is Shemitah. Probably butchering the pronunciation of that, but hopefully that's pretty close. And it means release. That's what this word means. And so it's, the, it's this idea of release, of letting go. And we know that the Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath, is a rest for man from his works. And this is too, in a way, but it's more of a, a releasing the land that belongs to the Lord and acknowledging that. A Sabbath of the land. One Bible commentary says this, Every seventh year, the farmers are to leave the fields unplowed and the vines untended. 
God promises that the crops which grow naturally without human labor will be enough for everyone to eat. That's God's promise here. That if they do this, if they trust God in this, there's going to be enough for everybody to eat, for everybody to share. The Sabbath year actually makes good sense from a farming point of view. It allows the land to recover and so renew its fertility. But a far more important point is being made that God is the real owner of the land and that his people are only tenants. And that's the profound truth that we find here. Another Bible commentary says the spontaneous produce of this sabbatical year was free to all corners, but especially to the poor. We see God's heart going out to the poor. It was also a time for debtors to be released from their creditors, thereby freeing them from their financial burdens and keeping poverty out of the nation. Interesting. God knew and knows what he's doing. Another Bible commentary says there was to be no organized harvest and no selling of produce to others. So for one-seventh of the time, landowners and the landless were on equal footing living off the land. And I believe that this is kind of prophetic for our situation right now. That there is a, a leveling of the ground quote-unquote ground, metaphorically, upon which we all stand. And before the, the measures of social distancing got a bit more extreme, and uh, this was actually the last time that we all met together in, in our church building, before having to go to a solely online digital platform for a time, I had shared this thought that came to me, this realization of how quickly the playing field can be leveled in a time like this. How it doesn't matter where you're from, what your status is, what your story is, who you are, that there is a leveling of the ground. One more Bible commentary says that the Sabbath year was also, this, so this is really interesting, this to me speaks of, of what we should be doing in this time. What, what God would have us being active with in this time. The Sabbath year was also the occasion for a sort of Bible conference. When the, when the priests read and explained the scriptures to all the people, this was done during the annual Feast of Tabernacles, which would usher in the new year. Interesting. We were just ushered into a new year. It would take a great deal of faith for the people to trust God for their daily food. And we know the word says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, by the word of Christ. One more faith, we need to hear by the word of God. During that special year, the nation learned, or was supposed to learn, the meaning of give us this day our daily bread, give us each day our daily bread on a, on a way deeper level, on such an intimate level. And putting all these elements together as a whole, we see that the deepest, at the deepest level, the chief, pur chief purpose of the Sabbath year was to get God's people to remember and walk in the two most important commandments. Love God and love others. Here's the clincher. It never actually happened. This they did not follow through with this. This is not something that they, that they obediently carried out. Wearsby's commentary, Bible commentary, says, Unfortunately, there's no evidence that the nation of Israel ever faithfully obeyed this law, as seen in 2 Chronicles 36.21. The prophets often condemned the Jewish leaders and wealthy people for their ruthless treatment of the poor. Had the sabbatic year law been observed, it would have prevented the poor from losing their lands and the rich from amassing huge estates. The economy wouldn't have been perfect, but it would have been balanced much better. So what is the eternal principle of this? You may be thinking, like, why are we talking about the Sabbath year? Isn't this Old Testament? Isn't this law? 
So I often say the eternal principle. This is an idea of, of uh, interpreting Scripture and seeing the eternal principle, the eternal thread that's, that's woven from the Old Testament to the New Testament, from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. And in a really powerful way, Matthew Henry's uh, Bible commentary really touches well on, on how we connect the dots between this Old Testament law and mandate that never actually was followed out, the heart of it, and, and what we see in the New Testament church. He said, as the fruits of this Sabbath of the land were to be enjoyed in common, so the salvation wrought out by Christ, brought about by Christ, is a common salvation. And this sabbatical year seems to have been revived in the Christian church when believers had, as Acts 2.44 says, all things in common. And so it's like even though the Israelites, the people of God in the Old Testament, never actually uh, obediently followed through with the Sabbath year uh, lesson and principle, we see the heart of that, the eternal principle of that being revived and lived out in the lives of the early, in the life of the early church. The heart of it carried through. So what does a reboot look like? Breaking that down just a little bit more. What does a reboot look like? For some of us, it means to remember our first love, as Revelations 2, 4 says. That we go back to our first love, that we remember where we came from in the faith. That first experience of our lives being turned around and encountering Jesus Christ for the first time. Remembering that, that square one. For others, it's discovering that love for the first time. Maybe you haven't discovered it yet. 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love. And the famous John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So we see God in action. We see that he is love, and we see how that love is, is poured forth in the world. And we know what real love is, and we, that's how we discover. We discover by encountering God. So some of us, we need to remember our first love, and some of us need to discover love for the first time. And let me say that I believe this is a time to pause our productivity-driven world and make way for the prophetic. There's so many things that we've built up in our lives that I think get in the way of letting God speak to us. And those things need to be torn down. And we need to let those things go in this time and make way for the prophetic. Now, as just a little aside, I just want to go into explaining a little bit about, some detail about what the prophetic, what prophecy is. Too often, I think that that we only think of prophecy, that it's only understood as foretelling the future, predicting events. But that's just one facet of prophecy. What it really means is divine inspiration and utterance, or receiving, you could say, receiving communication directly from God. A prophet is someone who serves as God's mouthpiece to the world. The Launida Greek to English lexicon defines prophecy as this, to speak under the influence of divine inspiration with or without reference to future events, to make inspired utterances. What is the Bible? What is the Bible? Divine inspiration and utterance. So when we open ourselves to the scriptures and the Holy Spirit quickens it to us, shows us how it, it applies, those words apply to our life and current situation, is that not prophecy? Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. This is not to say that, that I don't agree with prophets in the New Testament church or prophecy in its more uh, official and formal setting that we typically think of. I absolutely believe it's not to say that prophets have no place in the New Testament church, but any prophecy must be weighed against the ultimate authoritative prophecy, which is the Bible. 1 Thessalonians 
5, 20 through 21 says this. Three things, three important things here. One, do not despise prophecies. So we're not to close ourselves off to the prophetic in the sense of, you know, people bringing prophetic words and stuff like that. But then it says, but test everything. So weigh it back to the word. And then hold fast to what is good. This is kind of the uh, divine sifting prophet process, you could say. Not just to take everything as a thus say at the Lord, but to... And so this is kind of an aside, but I just felt like it was important to clarify a little bit. So going back to, to kind of our main string of thought there, talking about productivity and being so driven by productivity, we as a society and a culture, especially in North America, but it's, it's invasive all over the world, we've got this ideology of productivity. And productivity in and of itself, just like money in and of itself, is not a bad thing. But how it's used, how it's related to, and essentially how it's worshipped, that is what causes a lot of problems. Money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's very important to clarify those terms. Even within the church, we've made oftentimes productivity an idol. I know that I am tempted to do so daily because it seems like, you know, and it's a good thing, being productive, being fruitful, like that's, that's biblical. But when we take it to the extent where productivity gets in the way of God speaking to us, that's when we're missing out on something. That's when we're missing something. So in this time of pause, or better yet, reboot, we have a unique opportunity to make room for God to communicate with us. A few weeks ago, Carla was, was speaking an awesome message, and she asked, she posed this question in the message that was so powerful, is what is the most important question we should be asking right now, is what is God speaking to us? What is God speaking in this time? And in a very simplistic, general way, I would say the same thing he's been speaking all along. Now, of course, the semantics of that, the play out of that in our lives, in our individual lives, and the way that we interact with God and find his creativity working in and through us and the details of our life, that's something that we really need to walk with God through. But the general, at the fundamental level, God's been speaking the same thing all along. Love me and love others. That's at the heart of it all. Love God and love others. This is the heart of it all, the eternal thread of God's love and character woven all throughout the Bible from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. And of course, going back again to, to defining love, to defining what love is, those of us we need to remember and some of us need to experience for the first time, we need to be able to experience his love firsthand. Otherwise, we won't actually know what love really looks like. Yeah, you can learn principles of love. We can learn what love looks like in action, but unless we experience it firsthand by the power of the Holy Spirit, by interacting with God ourselves, it's not the same thing. It's just words on paper. So for some, this may be a time to go back to square one and reevaluate everything in our lives in light of God's grace and his word. And for others, it may just be a matter of remembering what he has already done and believing he is still working in our lives and will continue to do his great work in us. There's a song by Elevation Worship that we sometimes sing called Do It Again. And there's this line that just stands out to me that I just think is so awesome and really applies to this right now is that I've seen you move, you moved the mountains, and I believe I'll see you do it again. That's just so good and such a good reminder for us. I believe we'll see him move again, and he is moving now. So perhaps, in a way, this is our Sabbath year. And remember, it's not about the letter of the law, if you hear what I'm saying. It's about the spirit of the law, the heart of the law, the eternal thread. So don't go setting a timer and a, a checkbox for, for every way to follow the Sabbath of the year, the year Sabbath, from now until the end of 2020. That's not what I'm saying. 
But what if God is using this for that very purpose? To show us how to trust him when everything seems to be falling apart at a much more tangible level. To remind us of the eternal importance of loving him and loving others. By the way, BT dubs, being mindful of physical distancing during this time is one big way that we show we love and care about others. And may I be so bold as to say, it's a big way we show our love for God. I know this is difficult right now, but what if we, what if we use this time? What if we use this time, if we buy it up, if we redeem the time to reflect on God's word and to listen for his voice. I remember when I, when I first started, when I first entered the work world, it's like 15, 16 years old, and I first started working in customer service and pushing carts around. And I remember there was a lesson that I desperately needed to learn, but I didn't have anybody to tell it to me yet at that time. <laughs> and that's not to watch the clock. Because, oh my gosh, I would watch the clock, I would check my watch like every five minutes, and it was the worst. An eight-hour shift felt like 24 hours. And I was so tired, and I was so exhausted, and it was so frustrating, and I hated my life, and I hated my job. Until I got to this one job, and I was working spraying grass seed plants in a, in a field, in an irrigation field. <laughs> I kept checking my watch, and my friend looks over at me, and he's like, I just don't check my watch. I just refuse to check my watch, or I don't even bring my watch with me, I think is what he said. And so I started to practice that, and it was a night and day difference. The day would just fly by, I would be more focused on being in the moment, and actually enjoying the presence of other people, and even enjoying the work of my hands, even if it was hard, because I'd be caught up in that, I'd be in the moment, instead of constantly looking for the day, the work day to end. So what if, instead of watching the clock, proverbial, in the proverbial sense right now, instead of watch, watching the clock, staring the clock down, having a staring competition with our clocks, fixating on when things are going to go back to normal, and maybe even looking for ways to shirk the, the you know, requirements of the government and stuff like, you know, work the system, you know who you are. Only got love for you. What if, instead of that, we spend time asking God to speak to us? And I'm not just talking about, like, a little offhand, like, oh, God, I want to hear what you have to say today. Okay, I'm going to go back to watching Netflix. Like, okay, there's nothing wrong with Netflix. Netflix is great, you know. <laughs> not everything on there is great, but I like it but in everything in moderation, right? And, and putting your priorities in place. If you're just constantly absorbed in watching something instead of spending time with God, there's something imbalanced. And you're missing out. That's the big thing. It's not, it's not like, ah, finger on you because you're not, you know, following orders. But you're missing out. We are missing out if we're not spending time in our prayer closet in that secret place, asking God, crying out to God for him to reveal himself to us. Choose to trust him. Ask him to reveal himself to you. And guess what? In that, he will reveal yourself to you. Matthew 6.25 very powerful verse says this, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. In other words, it is when we lose ourselves, our life, in him that we find life, true life. In losing ourselves, we find ourselves. Amen? Amen. So this, I believe this season can serve actually as a tremendous blessing and an activator for God's people. But we must remember to look to Jesus and follow him where he leads. Going back to that quote by C.S. Lewis about this idea of if you are on the wrong path, the quickest way to get to where you need to go is to do an about face, you know, do a 180, go back to that intersection where you got off course 
That's the quickest way to get back on course. And there's this, there's this movie I saw a few years ago that I think really paints, in my mind, it really paints a beautiful picture of what that looks like. So this movie's called On a Clear Day. I think it came out in like 2005. And it's about this, this Scottish guy named Frank. And, and basically, you know, we pick up in the movie where he has, has already been for several years dealing with a lot of anxiety and depression and feeling guilty over the loss of one of his sons who, as a child, drowned in uh, the ocean when they got out for a beach day. So he's really troubled by this, and what, uh, what it's doing essentially is it's breaking apart the family. It's breaking apart his relationship with his wife. The communication is breaking down with his other sons, especially one of them. He's estranged, distanced from. This son keeps trying to reach out, and he's just not having it. He's not connecting because he's just lost in this world of despair. And, and so basically what happens is this guy ends up, this guy Frank ends up taking on this mission being absorbed and obsessed with this mission to swim the English Channel. Now, the English Channel is, is just over 21 miles across from the coast of England to the coast of France. And the max temperature, the highest temperature of the water is 20 degrees Celsius. The warning where they're like, use extreme caution for anything below this level is 21. So the highest, the warmest water in this channel at any given time is already below that, you know, this is, this is a big feat that he's undertaking. And, and part of it, I think, is just to prove to himself something, to, to find his identity, to whatever it is. You know, he's just, he's, it's a philosophical conundrum, existential conundrum. And so, basically, he, he doesn't even tell his family at first, um, and he starts training for this thing with a, with a, with a group of close friends who help him train for this in smaller bodies of water and, and stuff like this. Obviously, tons of training has to go into this. And long story short, he, he does the swim, is almost to the other side. His son, the son that he's actually distanced from, that he's kind of just given the cold shoulder to because of his own guilt and depression, is waiting on the other side. Now, the important thing about this is if he wants to get credit for this swim, if he wants to stamp for it on his resume, so to speak, nobody can touch him until he's on dry ground, completely dry ground, on the uh, French coast. So nobody can touch him. So, but he, he basically, he gets to the other side, he's swimming into the shallow water, and he's just, like, he's just you know, a rubber chicken. Like, he's just totally gone limp. Like, he's just totally weak. Just th barely can stand up. And his son runs out into the water and reaches out his hand to help him. And everybody in the boat's like, no, what are you doing? Don't touch him. Because if he touches him, then that whole swim is moot. Even though he just did it, it's all canceled. It's all fail. It doesn't count. So anyway, they, he reaches out for him. His dad starts to reach out. They both, they don't touch each other, but they both fall into the water. They both slip and fall. And the dad gets up first. And what he does in this moment just blew my mind when I first saw this movie and just gave me the chills. He stands up, reaches out his hand with his just weak and floppy body with barely any strength, pulls his son up out of the water, and they embrace. He just embraces him, throwing away his entire achievement in that moment. Nothing else matters. It's all eclipsed by his love for his son. It's just this beautiful moment. And to me, that paints this, this such a vivid picture of what we're talking about with if you're on the wrong road, going back to the right road. If you've got your priorities out of place, that's how quickly you can turn around and go back to the right road and where love prevails. And fortunately, the guy on the boat who was like the referee, who was like, you know, making sure that this went down the right way, I think possibly for the Guinness Book of World Records. He kind of jokingly turns around and is like, I didn't see anything. But the dad didn't know that. So the movie ends well, so it's a happy ending. But the dad didn't know that. And yet he still threw his arms around his son and just didn't care about anything else. And I just think that's so beautiful. So I have a benediction that I want to say over us and that I invite you to read with me. It's on the screen from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 through 10. 
So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for speaking to us in this time, giving us hope, quickening your truth to us by your Holy Spirit. Help us to stand strong and to know that you are our strength. That it's not about finding our own strength, but it's about relying on yours. Pray that everything else would be eclipsed by your love and would just fall away in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So rest and reboot looks like letting everything fade away, everything drop, as you find yourself in the embrace of the Son of God. Amen.